Thank you and welcome to our NAACP webinar. Um, we're going to begin with, uh, I'll give you a few housekeeping. I think most people here know where the restroom is. Okay, and it's, it's right, I'm turning back here, uh, back there. This is for the retina folks. I know there are people that are on um, Zoom and um, you don't need to know, you already know where your restroom is, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, tonight, we are going to um, begin with our welcome, since you don't have the program, and then um, the legal will be Mark Sabbath, uh, Helen, <coughs> Helen Keller, oh Lord, help me, um, Su Suzanne Keller, Economics, um, Thomas Hadwin, Moral and Racial Justice, William Barber III. And then Action Forward, we'll have Karen um, Jones and Daquan Love. And they'll, we'll introduce you as, as we go. Also, our, our Air, Our Lives will be a personal story and how to connect locally will be Elizabeth Jones. And then we'll, near the, then we will have our, question, our Q and A question and answer. Now for folks that are um, on the Zoom, uh, just raise your hand and uh, Ms. Karen Jones will recognize you with your um, questions. And for the others, um, Kay, who's at the front table, will um, she'll recognize you because I won't be able to see you. And she'll recognize you with your, for your questions. Any questions? Concerns so far? Very good. And um, please uh, mute your phones because um, we want to be able to uh, control the background noises as much as possible. So as we begin, um, before our opening prayer, let me tell you who's going to be giving it. And I want to thank you for allowing us um, the facility, Bishop Stone. Um, Bishop Kell Stone's affiliations are Stone Bell Bonds, KP Medical Tra Transportation, the Bridge Center, Gretna, that's where we are right now, Incorporated, Gospel Tabernacle Outreach Center, NAACP leader. Kell is the owner of Stone Bell Bonds and co owner of KP Medical Transportation. Kel is also the founder and voice of Kel Stone Ministries. Kel is a bishop in the Lord's Church and founded and is the pastor of Gospel Tabernacle Outreach Center located at 106 Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, I like saying that, <laughs> um, Gretna, Virginia. In 2017, Mr. Stone and his church acquired what used to be the old Gretna Middle School and transformed it into a church. Acquired what used to be the old Gretna Middle School. Okay, just did that. What is now known as the Bridge Center. That's here. The Bridge Center focuses on helping to uplift and build our community through helping the people and youth in our community. Kel loves giving back to the community and fighting for what is right. The youth are our future, and Kale believes in investing and reaching out to the youth and the many members of our community. Thank you, thank you. And now, opening prayer. As we honor God, let us bow our heads. Father, we first say thank you, because you blessed us to see this day a day that none of us has ever seen before. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to come together in so many different ways. We ask you, God, most importantly, to let everything be said and done today, God, recognize and give you glory. We're not here today, God, because uh, we're looking to be a publicity for one individual, but we're here today, God, to do what is right, right in this earth, right in this land, right for your people. And Father, we ask you to bless every speaker, bless every uh, presenter, God, that we speak with clarity 
and God, that we come together in unity and strength. And Father, you understand and you know the task that is before us. And you know the many challenges that are before us. But God, I do believe with all of my heart that God, there's nothing too hard for you. And at the end of all the things, God, you will have the last say. We thank you and we give your name glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Every heart say amen. 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 And uh, we'll begin with Mr. Mark Sabbath, and he's um, going to speak to the legal. Mark Sabbath is a senior attorney with the Southern Environmental Law Center in Charlottesville. He was part of the SC SELC's team challenging permits for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and handles litigation on a range of energy, air, and water issues. Mr. Thank, you. thank you, President Royston, and thank you all for, uh, for being here and being committed and, and, and interested. Um, if, yeah, it was just, uh, just two years ago that we were having these, these same conversations about the Buckingham Compressor Station uh, right, in the, uh, right in the Union Hill community in, in Central Virginia. And, uh, and here we are again now um, in Chatham in Pennsylvania County with the, with the Lambert Compressor Station. Um, from the, the legal side, I'd like to talk just about, you know, just an overview of how this permitting process works, um, what's likely to happen next week on July 7th at the Air Board meeting, um, and then just highlight some of the problems with the, with the permitting process that we've seen um, for this Lambert Compressor Station. Um, this, uh, this station, as, as most of you well know, is part of the MVP Southgate pipeline running from Pennsylvania County, 75 miles south to Alamance County in North Carolina. And the compressor station, as with other compressor stations, is used to, to move gas along the pipeline. Um, it runs, you know, they run 24 hours a day and emit a number of pollutants um, into the air and into the community. Um, building and operating a, a compressor station like the Lambert station requires an air permit from the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that's usually issued by the Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, um, but for certain you know, high profile um, permits that, are, that um, compel a lot of public interest at the request of either DEQ or, or the public, um, uh, that permit can be referred for consideration by the full citizen air board, the air pollution control board. And that's, that's what's happened here. So we really have sort of four key parties or, or groups here. There's Mountain Valley Pipeline that propose uh, this, the whole project, including building this compressor station. There's DEQ, which has done an analysis and proposed a draft permit for this facility. There's the Air Board, which will make the ultimate decision on whether to grant or deny the public. And then of course, there's the public, there's the rest of us who um, do our best to provide comment and perspective during the process uh, and, and do everything we can to make uh, the voices of, of the community heard. Um, the, in terms of how the uh, DEQ and the Air Board decide whether to grant a permit like this, um, the main sort of air question they ask is whether the proposed facility, if it's operating in compliance with all of the conditions of the permit, um, will be in compliance with, uh, with air quality standards. Uh, but there are other responsibilities that the board has as well. They have these site suitability responsibilities. They have to consider the character and degree of the interference um, with the health and safety and property interests that, that are threatened to be caused uh, by the operation of this facility. And they have to consider the suitability of the activity, of this polluting facility to the area in which it is located. Um, and in the past, the board and DEQ have acknowledged, they finally did at the, at the end of the Buckingham compressor station process, acknowledge that that site suitability analysis does involve considerations of environmental justice, of, of disproportionate impacts, the potential for disproportionate impacts on communities of color and low-income communities. Um, and in fact, just last year, new legislation in, uh, in Virginia that was passed in 2020, the, the Environmental Justice Act and DEQ uh, policy as well, um, it, it's, it is now the policy of the Commonwealth to further the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of communities of color and low wealth communities. Um, so that is part of Virginia policy as well. Um, now, uh, turning to next week, the July 7th Air Board meeting, 
Um, there will be, you know, a, a number of sort of non Lambert related business items that will happen first starting in the morning. Um, and then uh, the, the Lambert section will likely begin with uh, a presentation by DEQ by Paul Jenkins, the air permitting manager at DEQ, who will give a presentation about the facility, about the permit, and about why they are recommending the approval of this permit and what they, you know, why they think this, this permit is acceptable and, um, and will, you know, and, and that they've done an acceptable job of considering all of these, um, all of these factors uh, we just talked about. Um, after uh, after um, the presentation by DEQ, there will likely be a, a number of, or during, there will likely be a number of questions from the board members to DEQ. And so a, a sort of question and answer between the board and DEQ. Um, and then there will be the public forum for people that have previously submitted comments during the, the comment period um, to, uh, to address the board directly and, and to address any um, anything the DEQ has said in response to, uh, to those comments from the public. Um, the board will likely uh, discuss, um, likely vote and announce a decision on, you know, on July 7th. It doesn't, they don't have to on July 7th, but it, it, that's typically what they, what they have done. Um, and then that decision uh, can be challenged in court, in federal court in, in Richmond in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, approval or denial can be, uh, can be challenged uh, after a final decision by the board. Um, so just with, with my remaining minute, I just wanna um, touch on, a, a, there, there are a number of issues with the permitting process that different uh, parties have raised. Uh, I just wanted to touch on, on two of them. One is uh, what I talked about before about consideration of environmental justice concerns um, and, and the, the, the sort of inadequate consideration that DEQ has given to the potential for the impacts of this compressor station, specifically the health impacts from the pollution from the station on communities of color in the vicinity of the station. Um, DEQ concluded that just because the facility's emissions would fall within the national ambient air quality standards, these, these national standards, that, that there would be no health risks, adverse health risks to anyone. So there couldn't be any disproportionate impacts to any particular community. And I think in a minute, um, Suzanne Keller will likely talk about why that's wrong as a matter of science. I'll just add, it's also wrong as a matter of law and uh, under the Friends of Buckingham decision about the, the, the ACP's Buckingham compressor station, um, the agency is still required to consider the likelihood that those living closest to the compressor station will be affected more than others living farther away, especially when we're talking about communities of color, low income communities. Um, there are also issues about whether um, DEQ should have considered stricter rec control requirements, um, whether electrifying the station using electric motors to power the compressors instead of gas fired turbines, which would all but eliminate the emissions from the station, whether they give, gave sufficient uh, consideration to sort of stricter limits, stricter controls like that. Um, but I will stop there and, and turn it back to President Royston and, and then to Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's so much. Oh, oh sorry. Well, I think everyone can hear me. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, um, thank you very much. And again, someone texted and said, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Anita Royston. I think everybody knows me. And I'm president of Pennsylvania County in AACP. So now let's talk about health. By the end of this, you're going to really know what this is all about and, and save your questions to the end. Um, we're going to talk about health. And that's Suzanne Keller, retired epidemiologist from the Virginia Department of Health whose career focused on using data to prevent bad health outcomes. She's a native Virginian who grew up in Petersburg with family roots in the Shenandoah Valley. Suzanne. Thank you, President Royston and the NAACP for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm just gonna being a scientist, I have to use my um, slides. It's kind of required. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm going to follow up on what Mr. Sabbath said and, and try to just talk a little bit about what the framework is that DEQ uses to think about health. Um, they basically work with the applicant to create a permit to pollute 
that maintains the national ambient air quality standards for criteria pollutants. Um, DEQ also looks at toxics uh, and in this Lambert permit formaldehyde and hexene uh, rose to a high, high enough level to look at. There are other toxics that will be emitted from this compressor station that, um, that didn't rise to that level, so DEQ isn't looking at it. And then, as, as Mr. Savin said, the Air Pollution Control Board has the final say on most permits. The, air, the board usually accepts the DEQ recommendation. Now, these criteria permits, this came out of the Clean Air Act. And um, these are the standards that you'll hear repeatedly uh, from Mike Dow from the uh, DEQ. These are health-based standards that are supposed to be um, protective, and they're supposed to be protective for even vulnerable populations. And the, these six criteria pollutants, particulate matter, um, nitrous oxides, carbon dioxide, and so on, volatile organic compounds um, are regulated and it, it has, they have limits in the permit that DEQ is going to issue to Lambert. One thing about the, the, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, we have a lot of data now and a lot of research that shows even when these criteria are met, there is still a health consequences both for morbidity and mortality. Um, and the more people are exposed to these pollutants, the higher risk there is, of course. The hazardous air pollutants include 187 toxics that are listed by the EPA. And it includes things like benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. These, these are compounds and substances that are emitted in the emissions from these compressor stations. Benzene, for example, there is no known safe exposure to benzene. Um, it's, it, it, and it does cause cancer. There are also radioactive substances in these emissions because in the Marsalis shale, there's a lot of naturally occurring radon and other radioactive elements. When they, when they do this fracturing into the rock, they're going to be releasing these isotopes. And they're going to be in the gas that is in the pipeline. During the pigging operations, where they put a pig into the pipe to clean the pipe out, these emissions are going to be released, and the sludge and the debris that comes out of these pigging operations is highly toxic and often radioactive. Now, particulate matter is the most dangerous um, pollutant that will be emitted by the Lambert compressor station. And particulate matter is also the leading cause, and when you think about air pollution, it is the most significant cause of mortality um, among people in the United States. So we have about 60,000 deaths a year um, from air pollution in the United States, and particulate matter is the, is the most significant cause. Particulate matter, I, I'm having trouble seeing the picture, but if you look at those little red dots, that is particulate matter that is 2.5 micrograms per, um, per liter. I, I can't even, I can't see what the, what the, what it is. But anyway, there, it's very small. So those, those kind of brown chunks, that's a grain of sand. This is a EPA graphic. The, the other, uh, the gray strand is a strand of human hair, and then those little dots. Those little dots are what are the size of particulate matter. So you think about how small that is, and that's what makes it so dangerous. We breathe it in; it comes into our lungs. It can get in the bloodstream, cause heart attacks, strokes. It can aggravate our lungs, have uh, uh, um, decreased lung function because of um, particulate matter, and so on. Now, the emissions from the compressor station comes just from the equipment itself. Um, they're called fugitive emissions. And um, there was a study of eight compressor stations in Texas that found that the emissions came from 2,126 different points, from the valves, from the connectors, from gauges, vents, and so forth. So emissions are constantly happening 
from these these facilities. Um, even uh, if they if they were you know as the gas is coming in, there's going to be gas escaping through the valves and so forth. And then the other main source and and really concern for health impacts are the routine and accidental blowdowns, where they are just a they just let let it rip, and all of this stuff goes out into the air, um, and those episodic, intense exposures to pollutants are what cause the short-term and acute kind of um, symptoms that people report, like eye and respiratory tract irritation, headaches, dizziness, visual disorders, fatigue. Um, skin reactions, nausea, and so forth. There's also been a very good and very helpful new study that came out last year that showed an association between volatile organic compound emissions from compressor stations and increased mortality. It's very hard to tease out, especially in like the fracking fields where there's fracking going on and compressor stations. It's very hard to say, well, you know, the exposure came from the compressor station when there are also ex multiple exposures coming from gas wells and so forth. So this was a very interesting study. It's the first one I've seen that really does a good job of showing the increased mortality associated with the exposures from these compressor stations. Um, I just want to say really quickly, and so I think I'm going on too long, the limitations of this air permit process is that these national ambient air quality standards were not meant to assess air quality risk near the source. These measurements are regional and they're done at tons per year and they're not showing what is actually happening to the bodies of the people who are right there close to the source of these emissions. They don't measure the, do the dose, the duration, or the intensity of the exposures. The other limitation from my point of view that, of DEQ is that they don't ex assess the health status of nearby residents. So you can think about the vulnerability of the people who live near, near the compressor station. And then there are other health hazards associated with these compressor stations like noise, light pollution, stress is a big one and the risk of a, an explosion. These health risks are not looked at by DEQ. They very narrowly look at the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So what we know is that the closer you are to the source of the emissions, the higher the risk, and that our current regulatory regime for air quality does not prevent short and long-term health impacts on individuals. And here's some references. If if we just, if we send out the slides, you'll have those. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we on economics, Thomas Hadwin. And Mr. Hadwin is president and CEO of ACN Energy Solutions. He was formerly an executive with electric and gas utilities in Michigan and New York. Presently, he is helping to shape energy policy in the U.S. and Asia. He advised U.S. senators on the selection of federal energy regulators, commented on numerous gas pipeline and power plant projects, including Dominion's 15-year energy plans, and testified in federal court about the lack of need for the MVP. Welcome. Mr. Hadwin. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to have a chance to speak with you all tonight to help understand why you're going through all of this. Let me uh, share my screen and we'll quickly go through some slides. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay. I think probably one of the questions you're all asking is why are you having to deal with all of this? 
do we really need any new pipelines and their compressor stations? That's an excellent question. And I've basically had the same answers just about for every pipeline that I've worked on. Just the beginning of this month, Dominion told the North Carolina regulator that for their uh, gas business that's using the Southgate pipeline, they don't expect any significant changes over the next 10 years in their requirements for gas supply, pipelines, or gas storage. And they didn't provide any evidence of new demand for needing extra supply of gas. They have a formula that says it will, but that, uh, that formula really hasn't been vetted properly. In fact, the US Energy Information Administration has said that the gas consumption in the area that's likely to be served by the MVP is going to decline over the next several decades. So why build something new when your demand is actually going to go down? Well, a couple of years ago, when Dominion was trying to salvage the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, they wrote a letter to FERC that says there's loads of capacity available in the Transco system. That's the pipeline that's going right through Pennsylvania and into North Carolina, South Carolina, and so forth right now. Dominion admitted to FERC that Transco has three times the capacity than what they're expecting to get from the MVP and Southgate combination. Mr. Hadley, I don't mean to interrupt you. Are you are you supposed to be sharing your slides at this time? Yes, you're not seeing it. No, we're not seeing your slides. Okay. Go ahead. If it's okay with you and share them from this end. Yeah, Tom, we have um, we have your slides as well over on our end. If you'd like us to screen share. Well, I thought I hit the share. You want me to try one more time? Yeah, go ahead and try one more time, and if that doesn't work, we got you. Now it's not coming up this time. Well, you want us to, to go ahead and bring them up for you? Let me bring mine down a little bit and see if it will come up. No, I'm not getting the screen hit to share screen this time. Go ahead and bring it up and I'll, I'll work through it again. Is that working okay? That's fine. Can everyone see it now? Yes. Okay, the question I was addressing is, why do we need any new pipelines? And in fact, this is a, an image of the MVP under construction. Uh, next, please. Dominion told the uh, regulator in North Carolina that they didn't expect to need any new requirements for gas supply or pipelines of storage over the next 10 years. But here we are, they put this application in some time ago uh, to be the main user of the Southgate pipeline. But they don't have any evidence, next one please, they don't have any evidence of new demand that they've given either the state regulator or FERC, the federal regulator. They just have a formula that uh, says that they need more, but it's, well, that's all it is, just a formula. Next one, please. But the United States Energy Information Administration that gathers information from utilities throughout the country and then makes projections said that the gas consumption throughout the United States, but particularly within the area that might be served by the MVP, is going to go down over the next several decades. Next. And when uh, Dominion was trying to hang on to the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, they wrote a letter to FERC that says that Transco, the pipeline that goes through uh, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and down the Gulf Coast, says they have plenty of capacity to take care of all the customers in North Carolina that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was supposed to provide for, which would include public service of North Carolina, the gas company that would use Southgate. In fact, the number they gave FERC was three times larger than what they would be getting from the MVP and Southgate combination. Next. So there's really no reason to duplicate what already exists. Transco serves all of PSNC's uh, service territory. And if you can look on this map, you see the straight line that's going from the com compressor station uh, directly uh, 
to the southwest, that's where the Transco corridor is. There's four pipelines in that corridor and Southgate's intended just to add one more alongside that pipeline. And then take it into the uh, PSC, uh, NC service territory. Next one, please. Now, earlier this year, Transco completed an upgrade of that compressor station that's in your neighborhood there. They uh, changed to more modern uh, gas turbines for compressors and allowed it to provide more capability than what the compressor station that the MVP says they need to put in for Southgate. So one of the things that Dominion was always saying, oh, we don't have enough pressure down here in North Carolina for our gas customers. We need to put in this pipeline and a new compressor station. Well, Transco already put in, made some changes. They didn't put anything new. They upgraded what was already there to have a capability that's greater than what the MVP and Southgate would provide. So there's really no purpose for that compressor, compressor station there. Next. Next one, please. Now to make things even worse, this new project, uh, MVP and the Southgate extension is so expensive that the contract that uh, Dominion North Carolina has signed with the MVP or, or says that they will enter into, will add over $4 billion in higher energy costs to those customers in North Carolina for no added value. They're not getting any more gas than they could get otherwise. They're just paying a whole lot more for the cost of transporting it because this $4 billion has to be paid whether or not uh, that full amount of the capacity on the pipeline is used or not. The gas is purchased separately. This is all just to pay like a reservation on the pipeline. Next, please. So obviously this is a bad deal for the ratepayers. Next. And the industry executives, the politicians, the regulators at the state and federal level are pretty much ignoring the fact that this pipeline is unnecessary. The compressor station adds no value. All it does is cost customers more. Next. So let me just sum up. The message is that Southgate and its compressor station is unnecessary for the people in North Carolina to have the gas they need. It duplicates what's already there and costs much less. And it will increase the cost of energy by billions of dollars just for a 20 year contract. That contract has to be renewed every 20 years. So this billion. And because it's unnecessary and it duplicates what there, it creates environmental damage and health effects to you all that live nearby that don't need to be done. And there really isn't any benefit to you. There's very few permanent jobs. For the 600 mile Atlantic Coast Pipeline, there was 39 permanent jobs, 25 of them were at headquarters and the other 14 were spread out over 600 miles. So you can see we're just talking about one or two uh, jobs for uh, maybe an inspector that's looking at uh, 50 or 100 miles of pipeline. So no benefits, duplication, and the only benefit that might accrue is profits that go to the parent company that owns the pipeline. Now Dominion does not own Southgate or the MVP. They sort of learned that that was a bad thing to do at the outset for the ACP. But if those pipelines get fully approved and it looks like they'll be built, there's nothing to stop Dominion from going in and buying those. And then they would get all the profits that come from charging their customers billions of dollars extra. Okay. I hope you get that. And I'm sorry if you're sad to say, why are we going through all this uh, for something we don't really need it has no benefit, but that's the story. Thank you. Second, we were muted. There we are. We're back. Okay. Thank you very much. And audience, um, those on, on Zoom and those that are 
here in the bridge center. I know that you have you had questions coming in and now you see knowledge is power. So you're being empowered. Next we have William J. Barber the third and William J. Barber the third is the strategic partnerships manager for the climate justice initiative at the climate reality project. William holds a doctorate UNCG, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Climate, excuse me, at Chapel Hill School of Law, where he earned his Juris Doctorate. William has worked on environmental policy with the UNC Law Center for Climate Energy, Environment, and Economics, Clean Water for North Carolina, and Clean Energy Works. William currently serves as a member of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality Secretaries, Environmental Justice and Equity Advisory Board, as well as co-chair for the North Carolina Poor People's Campaign Ecological Devastation Committee. William serves for two years as a, he served for two years as a field secretary for the North Carolina NAACP for two years and serving as one of a three member leadership team for Moral Freedom Summer. A long-term voter mobilization campaign spearheaded by the North Carolina NAACP, William attended college at North Carolina Central University where he completed an undergraduate degree in environmental physics. He is interested in the renewable energy field, specifically in initiatives that are being taken to promote opportunity for modest income communities and communities of color. Welcome, Dr. Barber. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, as I was listening, I was going to tell you, you know, you could, you could cut to the chase. I'm really here because I want to lend support. I'm a community activist and I want to let you all know fighting in Virginia that you have some help, some support in North Carolina. Uh, let me start off by saying it's so good to see each and every one of you on the call. Um, there are many uh, faces that I see considered comrades in arms. Uh, I see Karen, thank you for having us here. I see John, thank you for your tireless efforts. Uh, I see my NACP brother Daquan, love, it's good to see your face as well. Um, and, and so many more of you who have just really committed to putting your bodies, giving your time, uh, you know, uh, for one more Goliath, one more Goliath. And I really, you know, I could talk about the science, could talk about uh, some of the policy, but we have a lot of experts who have already touched on that. I really just want to encourage you all to fight one more time. You know, we've seen this in the form of the recently uh, defeated Atlantic Coast Pipeline. We came together and we pushed there. We've seen this in the form of big corporations who have tried to stop the momentum for what we know is going to be a just and equitable transition to a clean economy. We've seen people try to slow, uh, uh, slow drag our response. When we find ourselves in this moment, this urgency of now, as Dr. King says, when we talk about a burgeoning climate crisis that affects us all, but in particular impacts poor communities, rural communities, and communities of color. We've seen it when we talk about the connection between environmental injustice and the onslaught of a pandemic like COVID-19, where we recently saw that because of legacies of environmental racism, decades of that, we saw a disproportionate impact in terms of the death rate, who was actually killed by the pandemic of COVID-19. You know, because of the disproportionate impact, when we talk about air pollution, communities of color being exposed, African-Americans being exposed to 21% more air, air pollution nationwide than their white counterparts, Hispanic Americans being exposed to 12%, because of legacies and decades of that, when we come around and face COVID-19, a pandemic that attacked the respiratory system, we saw increased fallout. So why do I make these references? Because what you all are fighting in Virginia is much bigger than what's in Virginia. 
this is about a regional struggle. This is about a global issue. When we talk about the fight against environmental racism and we talk about the fight against a climate crisis. There are a couple of things I wanna say just very briefly. We talk about the racial impact of this project. Racial, why? Because communities of color are expected to bear the brunt of the air pollution from this compressor station. But not only from this compressor station, from most fossil fuel infrastructure that is implemented. For decades, for generations, communities of color have suffered being the ones the closest and suffering the, the, the first and worst from the harming polluting aspects of fossil fuel infrastructure. They're like the two evil twins of the same coin. It's reckless because we talk about the responsibility that we have. It's, it's irresponsible to build new fossil fuel infrastructure at a time when a climate crisis is forcing us to rapidly shift to clean renewable energy resources, not as an option, but as a matter of survival. As a matter of survival, the urgency of this moment, the urgency of now is that the UNIPCC report has given us a window of nine years currently to take sweeping action to address the climate crisis. That means moving away from fossil fuel infrastructure. That means investing rapidly in clean energy. That means taking environmental justice and pushing back against pollution seriously. And we have the means to begin to do that. We know that Virginia and North Carolina both have state legislation that have the opportunity, the potential to point us in the right direction. Virginia with the Clean Economy Act uh, and North Carolina with the Clean Energy Plan. Now we could push and argue and say that those don't go far enough, but those are they're pointed in the right direction at least. So now is not the time to recklessly invest in, as was already said, unnecessary fossil fuel infrastructure, especially when there are better ways to meet our energy needs. And then this is a ripoff because when we talk about who bears the brunt financially of this unnecessary project, of this stranded asset, it is the utility payers, the captive utility payers, is the people who are already wrestling with energy burden, is the people who don't have a say in where their energy comes from, for these billion dollar projects, it, it, it profits the shareholders of these companies, but it drives up energy bills for the rest of us. So these are why these projects are unnecessary. This is why it's such an urgent issue to understand that this is not just an environmental issue. This is a civil rights issue. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a social justice issue. It's an issue about poverty and why we need you all in Virginia to fight one more time and not just in Virginia, but also in North Carolina. And just to talk a little bit, we know that compressor stations, they keep some of the damaging aspect is they keep natural gas flowing through pipelines at high pressure. Some of this was already talked about. They're loud, they're invasive. These industrial facilities run up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are highly polluting. Actually the most polluting aspects of natural gas infrastructure, especially during blowdowns, right? Where, which are these procedures where they vent the pipeline and it's used to regulate the pressure of the actual infrastructure. We heard already a little bit about the air pollution that surrounded these projects. According to a report by the Physicians for Social Responsibility, air samples collected around compressor stations have shown elevated concentrations of many of the dangerous substances associated with frack gas, including volatile organic compounds, compounds that interact dangerously with the body, particulate matter, and gaseous radon amongst others. These have sweeping detrimental health effects, especially when you're talking about constant exposure to these chemicals, including skin rashes, respiratory, neurological, and gastrointestinal problems. And again, who's bearing the brunt of that? The ratepayers, the people already wrestling with energy burden, people of color, rural communities, poor individuals, our elderly. So when we think about that, this moment, this, this, this conversation that we're having has to be the beginning 
and the continuation of a struggle to understand why this is such an urgent issue. And in closing, you know, I will say that, you know, talking to you all from North Carolina, which many uh, hold out as the birthplace of the, Amer the, the American uh, environmental justice movement. Story there was that in Warren County in 1982, I believe, uh, communities of color supported by allies really came together in mass for the first time in our nation's history. Actually, the second time. The first time was when uh, Dr. King was actually went to organize with 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 um, uh, sanitary workers in Memphis. But in Warren County in 1982 communities came together, put their bodies on the line and said, you are not going to dump dangerous PCB chemicals in our community without us standing up and letting you all know that this is not right. And I say and keep that date 1980 in my mind for two reasons that I'd like to share with you all. One, that when we talk about this notion of environmental justice, it is not that long ago. This fight for environmental justice is not some historic thing that has already been achieved. Yes, we see representation at the EPA. Yes, we see shifts in this administration. Yes, we have seen victories. So many thankful to you all, but this is a very present fight, a very recent fight. So we cannot take it for granted, cannot take the sacrifice of those who have come before us for granted. And two, I keep that in my mind because I remind myself that everything we have foundationally, when we think about environmental justice, when we think about climate justice, when we think about the narrative that allows us to push against these polluting projects right now, everything we have, we are inheriting that legacy for people who tirelessly gave their all. And so who are we to do any less? And so it warms my heart and I'm so thankful to join a cohort, a coalition, a group, a family of people scientists, activists, landowners, uh, 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 informed uh, allies who are going to say in this moment, we have the courage to say this is not right. And in our time, we're not going to allow this project to go unopposed. So I thank you. Say for it together. I'm looking forward to many more conversations with you all, including the strategies when we talk about how we can support both from Poor People's Campaign and Climate Reality Project. But this is a fight just like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, just like uh, 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 the fight for the climate crisis, just like every major moral fight we have faced, we're going to win. We're going to show them how the South gets down and organizes. And we're going to see some good things. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and next, we're going to have um, action forward. Uh, Karen Camplin, and Karen is the Environment and Climate Justice Chair for the Virginia State Conference, NAACP, and the co-director of the Green New Deal Virginia Coalition. Karen provides resources and support to local communities to address environmental injustices, promote efforts to improve quality of life and health, and advocate for transformative policy and program changes. Karen is focused on advocating for and protecting communities from harmful energy production processes and discriminatory practices. She is also the co-chair of transportation for the Sierra Club, Virginia, and believes addressing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector is a crucial link towards building sustainability and equity in our communities. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, President Royston. It's great to be here um, and I see so many faces. But before I start on my presentation, I just wanted to do a couple nods. I wanna say thank you to Karen Jones, who is the Virginia State Conference Assistant Secretary, as well as the Environmental and Climate Justice Committee Chair for the Montgomery Radford Floyd NAACP branch. Thank you, Karen, for being with us. And I also wanna say hello and thank you to Daquan Love, 
I, or should I say, I, what I really should say is ec Executive Director Dacon Love. And I'm gonna ask him to say a couple words before I start. But before you start um, with your, um, your comments, um, Director Love, I just wanna give a brief background for you as well. Um, so Director Love began with the Virginia State Conference NAACP in January of this year. He's an Enrico County native and is the, I have to say this because I'm so proud of this, he's the sixth and youngest person to hold this position. Headquartered in Richmond, Director Love is intimately familiar with the issues that Black Virginians face and has been a force to be reckoned with from day one when he started with the Virginia State Conference as he uh, helps to guide the Virginia State Conference in the, in, um, with the issues that we need to address. Director Love, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Karen. I, I didn't know we, uh, the, we were gonna have a whole introduction there, but I, I've got to steal those words and, and put it in, add it to the bio. Uh, thank you so much, Chair uh, Camplin. Uh, I'm Daquan Love. Uh, on behalf of President Robert Barnett, who was unable to be with us today, um, he, he wanted to be on, but he's actually on another call with the President and CEO, Derek Johnson, this evening. Um, uh, discussing very important matters of the association. Uh, and so I, I'm delighted that we are here today and we have such strong attendance to discuss this important issue impacting black and brown Virginians, but not just black and brown Virginians, but Virginians um, at large. We know environmental and climate justice um, is not a back burner issue. It is a, an issue that we have placed on the forefront um, not just here in Pennsylvania, but in other communities across the Commonwealth, like in Hanover County, where the Virginia State Conference is uh, in collaboration with our Hanover branch is suing uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, to fight to protect um, the Brown Grove community and the, the, uh, the, the waterways uh, in that area. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you all know how important this work is. I don't need to remind you of that. What I've come here this evening to tell you is that the Virginia State Conference NAACP is here to support you. We are glad to be partners with you in this fight and in this struggle. And uh, the Virginia State Conference, which is comprised of over 100 branches, youth councils and college chapters in this co Commonwealth will not stop fighting for you and for this important effort. We're holding our corporate uh, partners accountable. We're holding our government partners accountable. But moreover, we are fighting forward and fighting for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Director Love. And I think with that, I, I, I don't need to say anything else about the uh, state involvement. I think you said it as powerfully as, as, as possible. Um, but before I get into what our next steps that we can do to uh, continue to support the Pennsylvania um, branch, I just want to just do a quick overview of what steps that have been taken both by the branch as well as the state conference to bring us to where we are today. Um, it started out in March when the uh, Pennsylvania um, branch um, uh, adopted a resolution to um, um, oppose the uh, air permit for the Lampert compressor station. And then they followed it up with a very powerful um, comment um, a statement of opposition that they submitted during the comment period for um, during the uh, permitting process um, to uh, Virginia DEQ. Um, they then approached the Virginia State Conference and as Daquan said, the moment we heard about what was going on, we definitely 100% um, um, reached out, I mean, continue to work with Pennsylvania and are um, definitely in support. And we are standing shoulder to shoulder with the branch in trying to seek resolution. But that we, it doesn't end just here as we've heard um, by our speakers before me is once we get through this, then we are gonna have to talk about how to, what, what steps we need to make sure that the community heals and that we have some resiliency um, um, solutions in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the whole process. And so this position that both the branch and the state conference takes is in 100% in, um, in, in, um, in support of what our net national directives is for the environmental and climate justice program, a program that started 11 years ago and was identified, uh, identified as a game changer 
during the 2020 annual conf national conference. What are game changers to NAACP? Those are issues that NAACP identified as having significant influence on the socio and economic advancement of uh, people of color. Um, and, and, and so um, this program, the ECJ program is guided by three objectives. One, which is to reduce or eliminate harmful emissions, which is what this compressor station is. Um, two, advance energy efficiency, as well as clean, renewable, and non-extractive energy sources. As, and then three, or third objective, is strengthen community resilience, health, and livability. Everything we're discussing here today. So I hope that you will continue to support. And if you're new here, please keep in contact with the Pennsylvania branch and, and find out ways in which you can continue to promote and amplify the voices of the community and make sure the residents have meaningful participation in the decision-making process here today. And especially when those decisions have significant impact, not just today, but for generations to come. Our health is our wealth. Without our health, there's so many things that we're not going to be able to do. And we must do everything we can to protect it. And our natural resources, such as air, land, and water is definitely a part of that. So what are some of the things that you can do to make sure that we find a, the, the right resolution to this, which is the denial of this air permit? As you have seen in the chat and your handouts indicate, there's going to be a um, public hearing that's gonna be held by Virginia DEQ on July 1st, um, pardon me, on July 7th. And in prep preparation for that, um, our allies, Appalachian Voices, Chesapeake Climate Action Network, and the Sierra Club will be conducting a preparation meeting on July 1st, beginning at 6, and it's going to be an online meeting. And then I'm, I'll be posting the event link and all of the information that you would like to, um, that you would need to register and be able to attend that event. Um, like I said, the public hearing is going to be on July 7th. This public hearing is going to be in person in Richmond, and we understand that this is going to have some mobility issues for um, the residents in Pennsylvania County. So we are working um, diligently to try and find ways in which we can get um, the voices of the Pennsylvania residents to be heard in Richmond on July 7th. Right now, um, there is a restriction on who can make a comment. Um, if you have not made a comment to DEQ, um, there may be some other ways that we are working on. So the second link that I'm gonna be um, um, posting into the chat, and I'm gonna do this right now, is if you sign up here, we are trying to find ways in which we can make sure that everybody's voices are here, heard. It might be through social media campaign, it may be a, a campaign bulletin board, we're not really sure right now, but this is the best way in which we can make sure that we can keep track of you, that we can make sure that your voice is heard on July 7th. And then of course, if you're able to, um, you know, um, you know, our voice is amplified in numbers. So if you can make it down to Richmond, if just to stand in, in solidarity and show support, that goes a long way. That visual um, of having um, uh, folks to be there to support our, our friends and neighbors in Pennsylvania County is very important. And so to attend the air, uh, uh, air pollution control hearing, um, here is the link for that. And so, like I said, um, a lot of our options are, are still in the works. And one another way that you can keep up to date between now and July 7th is to check frequently with the Pennsylvania County um, NAACP's Facebook page. That is where our most um, up-to-date information is going to be posted. Um, and you can also reach out to um, Elizabeth Jones, who is the environmental, um, okay, I'll update that link, um, environmental and climate justice committee chair, um, and she'll be speaking shortly. Um, if you have any um, in, um, questions, we'll be definitely, um, she'll be able to direct you into the right direction or have an answer for you. And finally, another way in which you can stay in contact with everything is we have two uh, petitions that are showing support of the, um, that we're in opposition to the air permit. And I'm going to uh, post those links to the two uh, petition. If you have not signed either of those petitions, 
please make sure to sign up. So, um, so in conclusion, I would just like to say thank you for being here. Please keep in contact with us. Um, if you can make it down to Richmond on July 7th, please join us. If you can carpool, please check in with um, some of the um, residents in Pennsylvania. It would be great if we can you know, get a carpool or definitely um, sign up on the um, 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 ways in which you can sign up here for your um, comment to be um, a part of the um, public hearing. And so with that, thank you very much. And I'll pass it back to President Royston. Thank you. Thank you. And a quick question for you. Uh, and again, um, those of you who are on Zoom, we just um, raise your hand and you'll be um, uh, monitored through, the, through Karen, Karen Jones, I think. And um, for those that are here, again, Kay will recognize you for your, for your questions. And also, since you can't go into the chat and get all the links, um, there's most of them are on the sheets that are up front. And if you and if you get leave your email address, then we'll be able to send other information to you as well. Okay. All righty. So next we have um, local, our air, our lives, a personal story, and how to connect locally by Elizabeth Jones, who was pretty much introduced just a moment ago. Ms. Jones. Hello, everyone. This is Elizabeth Jones and Anderson Jones. My husband is here. We're farm owners and community activists in Pennsylvania County. I'm the daughter of sharecroppers who left the segregated South in 1945 because economic, social, and political justice didn't exist for African Americans. Anderson's the uh, has roots in the Native American community, and this is why we have this 98-year-old farm. It's a quarter mile from the Transco Williams compressor station. Some of the property has been uh, given easements and now has MVP pipes, 42 inch pipes buried in the ground. And what makes us think about our area because we have Loblolly Pine, 32 acres of Loblolly Pine, a custom built house here in uh, the neighborhood. And, you know, we're saying to ourselves, what's happening? Um, what has been happening in our own backyard is unbelievable. The Mountain Valley Pipeline LLC is seeking an air quality permit approved by the Department of Environmental Quality. Well, again, we already have a compressor station. We have Transco Williams Compressor Station. That is actually two compressor stations. And as you heard tonight from our health expert, our uh, lawyer expert, uh, and from uh, William Barber and our state representatives at the NAACP, uh, it's time to say no to this kind of expansion and this kind of energy because our community does not need a business of pollutants. And we feel that that is one of the reasons why we're in this fight, because we do not want it. The pipeline has gone through many difficult times with counties in Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, because nobody wants pipelines. And I'm sure that this greed and need for more compressor stations and more pipelines that, that sell natural gas is, is needed, but we don't need it. I'm sure some of these very executives do not have or live near or have their family near a pipeline. And uh, they bought the farm next to us, right at the property line. MVP has... Uh, held tough through most of these counties. And I'm asking why us? 
Why in our backyard? Why in Bannister District? Is this, this is not the kind of business we need. Well, the facts are more African Americans live near coal fired and biomass power facilities than any other demographic group in the United States. Over the past several years, or really decades, 68% of African Americans have or have lived within 30 miles of these kinds of uh, power plants. And as a result, we're more likely to have health problems from pollution these, these facilities emit. I'm the chair of the Pennsylvania County NAACP Environmental Justice Committee, and we're all in the struggle for environmental and climate change justice because it's a civil right and it's a human right to have clean air and clean water. Anderson and I feel that our quiet enjoyment here in this county in our location is being jeopardized and we need to do something about that. You know, systemic racism is real and it's our enemy because the worst part of systemic racism is that you don't know what it's done or how it's done it until the damage is already done. And communities must uh, begin to be advocates for clean air and water, speak up on it because uh, we have to fight against polluters. The NAACP is fighting to keep clean air and water, green energy jobs. These are important tools that, and, and, and issues that will make us a better and a stronger country and community. We don't like to think about the fact that carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, all these pollutants will be in our neighborhood. And we are speaking for our neighbors because Anderson has asthma, his mother died from asthma, and we don't want our community to be affected in this negative way with uh, property values going down and um, really unable to sell property. He can't sell property to people who uh, know that this is a cancer causing uh, a pollutant area. We want to be part of the environmental justice community, but we have to have communication. We have to have information. And that's why we're so happy that uh, all of you experts are helping us to uh, fight and win this battle. Um, I'm afraid of these poisons. Anderson and I are angry at the lack of um, information from the leaders in our locality and state and federal levels. They, they're not telling us about the community as they should or the pollutants as they should. And we want that to end. So from here on, you know, it's easy to become a victim of these fraudulent marketing techniques that are used by uh, corporation lobbyists. And we're going to do our best to keep the residents informed because that's what the resolution and the comments to DEQ discuss. They discuss the, the need for information to go out to the community and to residents. But we're in a battle to end natural gas pipelines and compressor stations because our air is, is our life. And uh, that's all I have to say. Any calls or questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Anita Royston. Thank you, thank you. I, I knew you were coming to a close with you, your, your line, our air is our life. Thank you so much. Now everyone, um, you've heard it from the experts and um, I'm sure you have questions and I, I know that you, you like having clean air and um, water. So if there are any questions here, 
um, please raise your hand, let, let um, Kay know. Um, do you have any? Just here. We, got, we got a whole room. Okay. Ms. Jones, are there any questions on that end in your chat? We do not have any questions yet, but I want to encourage everyone in the Zoom, if you do have a question to be recognized, um, please use the reactions key button and click the raise hand function so that we can recognize you to ask your question. And everyone, please, until, unless you're speaking and, and you, while others are speaking, I guess that's the same thing. President Royston, I think we had, um, a data request for one of the speakers. Can is it okay if I jump in? And it, it was to um, Thomas Hadwin um, that they wanted um, the resources um, for you to cite the resources. So when they speak to their elected officials, they would be able to um, cite the resources that you used in your presentation. Yes, um, so you're asking, they're asking for him to send them, um, to email them to, to them, or to come back on and, and cite the resources. No, if he, if, when he may, if he makes the presentation available, if he can also include that information as part of that package. So if he can just send that to us with his slides, then we'll make sure when we um, send out the email to everybody with a link to the presentation and, and all of the supporting documents, we can have that, a list of the cited resource, but no, you don't have to cite it now. Thank you. And that's something that all of you would like to have as well. Everyone is here. We'll make sure we have your um, email addresses. Can, can you hear him or do you, you use your outside voice or your preacher voice? Or you can go to your Okay. Or my, I can I question, can bring the mic to you yeah, as well. My question is this. Here's my question. Um, he, excuse me. He actually, if he can use the microphone, we're having difficulties hearing. Okay. My question is, um, on July the 7th, when the, the presentation goes forward, and it goes not in our favor. And one, are we prepared? Are we going to appeal it to the Court of Appeals? Uh, then if it goes to the Court of, of Appeals and we still don't win and get the results that we desire, then what do I need to tell my family that lives in the area of this, this station? Uh, what's the plan? Do I need to tell them, move, sell your house now, uh, is it just going to go away? We lost, it's over with, just deal with it. What is the plan after that? Or is there a plan after that? Someone would like to address that? What are the next steps? This is Mark. I won't, I won't speak for everyone. I will say that there are are a, n a number of lawyers, including some on this call that are, are watching this process very closely, have you know have submitted extensive comments during the comment period, and will be will be at the hearing on uh, on the seventh, and uh, uh, you know will be participating in it, and we'll be seeing you know what the decision is and the basis for the decision, and we'll be you know looking at that very closely about whether um, whether a legal challenge would be appropriate after that, and, and you know and talking with. Um, with groups that would want to would want to bring that challenge, so um, there it, there's not a you never know sort of ahead of time what's going to happen and and um, next, but uh, but there are a lot of people giving it a lot of thought. Uh, this is Thomas. <clears throat> there's a lot going on as as Mark talked about uh, in the legal process. The longer that goes on the more apparent it is that this project is not good for the people who have signed contracts to ship on the pipeline. Because they, the pipeline has gotten so expensive, 
that the gas that's ultimately delivered by it is going to be more expensive than the gas from anywhere else. So no one's going to want to buy it. EQT is the nation's largest gas producer. And if they have to pay for their original allotment, they have to pay about $620 million every year, about $12.5 billion for that 20 year contract, whether they use all that they have reserved or not. And they have already told financial analysts is they don't need the MVP. In fact, financially, they hope it gets canceled because then they won't have to pay for something that they don't need. So there's a lot going on here uh, as this process rolls along. Now, Dominion's come in and spoken up for some of that capacity. They sort of want to reinvent the, M the ACP with the MVP and take it through North Carolina down into South Carolina. It was a bad idea with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and it's a worse idea with the MVP. But so there's a lot of these economic pressures going on that could lead to the same outcome that we saw with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. It just the, the bad decisions and that financial cost of it overwhelms those so they can't support it anymore. I'm not saying that's going to be the outcome. I'm just saying that's still a possible outcome. And the more these uh, negative court cases, uh, the court cases come out with opinions that don't favor the pipeline or make it uh, go longer and longer, things just get more expensive and it becomes more apparent to the general public and to the politicians that these things just really didn't make sense in the first place. So there's, there's hope. Can we, we need the uh, will the state and NAACP um, be a client in the lawsuit contesting the passage, possible passage, unhoped for passage of the air permit for the Lambert compressor station? Um, is there, is Derek Daquan uh, still on? Okay. Yeah. Um, no, okay. I would say that um, with all of the other lawsuits that have happened, for instance, Union Hill, um, the one in um, Hanover County for Wegmans that the Virginia State Conference has been active in all of those. Um, but you know, not to go into too much details, but it would also involve Nashville as well. So if the branch does make that decision that that's the direction in which they go, they will have the support of both the Virginia State Conference as well as national. Thank you. Anita, Anita, I have a couple of questions from folks here in the Zoom. If we could let them ask their questions. Um, the first is from Richard Shingles. Thank you. Dr. Keller mentioned um, a, st a recent study uh, uh, about the uh, negative impacts of air quality on uh, um, adjacent communities to compressor stations. I wondered if that a link to that study or the name of the study and how we might get it could be put in the chat. I'd, I'd like to read it and, and, or, and other studies to that effect. Um, I, so someone already responded to this and mentioned the DEQ page, but there's a lot of things that have been submitted to DEQ. I, I, was, I would appreciate what she thought were one or two or three of the of the most useful references. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in the chat. The Hendricks study that that looked at um, that looked at um, mortality around compressor stations. Just to be clear. Most of the information we have about compressor stations and health impacts is very clinical. That is, it's um, especially in Southwest Pennsylvania where um, people collected information and data from residents um, in those communities. The problem is those communities are also the fracking fields. 
So like I said, it's very, there are not a lot of good studies that really show specifically impacts of the compressor stations. What we do is we kind of generalize. We know that compressor stations, stations emit all of these toxic pollutants. We know these pollutants cause problems. They aggravate respiratory system. They, they, they can cause um, particulate matter, you know, strokes, heart attacks, and so forth. So, so we kind of generalize from what we know so that's why, like, the expert, um, so-called expert study that was submitted by the Green Toxicology Group on this project um, is, is pretty worthless in terms of understanding the actual impacts on people's bodies who are, you know, they're not measuring the dose, duration, or intensity of exposures. So what I would suggest you do, if you want to look at the best expert comments that I, I've looked at in, um, in the, on the DEQ page, look for the SELC submission, the Southern Environmental Law Center, and you can search by that and look for the Appalmat, uh, Appalachian Advocate submission. And within those um, comments, they're going to be expert um, critiques of the air modeling and some other things. Hope that answers your question. I'll put the Hendrix um, in the chat. And President Royston, we have another question in the chat from Mr. John, and I apologize because I know I'm going to mispronounce your name, um, John Rossipe. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, Rose and Pepe. Um, I have a question that, uh, as I understand it, the uh, hearing begins at 10. Uh, uh, testimony uh, follows at 1. And with over a pool of 200 people, it looks like it could be a long day. Have groups, and it's at a hotel, have groups thought about getting a conference room so that people can uh, go in and relax, get information, be together? throughout the hearings or during the hearings to take a break instead of being in the room. I mean, I know when um, I worked out in Colorado and we had hearings like that, that's one thing we did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Appalachian Voices has rented a room. OK, thank you very much. Hey there, sorry, I'm kind of out of the view. Um, I think there is a chat response from Jessica Simpson. Appalachian Voices um, that says that they have rented a conference room hotel there. Okay, thank you. Maybe more info in the chat there. Do we have a question? Suzanne, this is for Suzanne Keller. Um, the, there has been a, a Transco compressor station here in Pennsylvania County, if I remember correctly, since 1957, pre-Clean Air Act, pre-regulations on, I, I don't know if there were any, I, I don't know, but um, it, there has to have been a whole lot of um, impact on air quality over those more than 60 years. Yes, Transco has improved, it's, you know, upgraded its compressor station in very recent years, but there, there has been impact on health that we have no way to, um, we don't know what it is. I mean, people here have heart attacks, respiratory difficulties, strokes, people everywhere. I mean, but we can't, we can't pin that on Transco, even though we know that that has to have been part of um, our 
our situation here. The comments that were made to DEQ those effects of, of which, I mean, that's part of the picture. And yet there, as I understood DEQ's response to that concern, it was something like, well, you're asking us to consider this a single source. And, you know, the way these things are defined, it's not a single source. We don't care what it's technically called. The point is that um, there have been effects on air quality all that time that should be part of this picture. Can you suggest any way to make that point that may have uh, an impact? Thank you. That actually was the, the bulk of Katie, that was the bulk of my comment. You can look at my comment in the in the comments that I submitted to DEQ. And and Bill Limpert also makes the case about this, which is the DEQ has no um, idea of the extent of contamination from Transco over these many decades. And the upgrade that was done to the Transco compressor station was you know substantially reduced the the pollutants coming from that station but the years before i mean the ha the volatile organic compounds that were coming out of there that they allowed um were just incredible so what i i had argued in my comment was that deq should be doing baseline testing in the community um air monitor air sampling um, inside people's houses to see what <laughs> what's already there. You know, what are the levels of particulate matter and other things that are already in people's houses right now? Um, that is not something that DEQ does. DEQ only looks at two things: are the are, will the will the facility be in compliance with the national ambient air quality standards? And did they do the best available control technology analysis? Those are the only two things. They're not really, this agency and the regulations that Virginia has are very weak. They are not designed to protect human health. They really are not. What they are designed to do is only to comply with what the federal government requires in the Clean Air Act and to get industries permitted so that they can do whatever they do because Virginia is open for business. So I would say, you know, requiring them, they are, I think they are going to do, they have done continuous emissions monitoring on the Transco line for NOx. The thing is, NOx, uh, the uh, nitrous oxides and, and the sulfur dioxides, that can form particulate matter in the atmosphere. It's not just the, the particulate matter coming out in the emissions. It actually forms in the atmosphere. So um, the answer to your question is we keep insisting on protection of human health and, and, and doing it um, saying that, uh, especially in these environmental justice communities like Pennsylvania County, that you have to take into account pre-existing conditions, looking at the vulnerability of the people there. We just, we, just have, we just keep insisting. We're insisting to Virginia government, we want our communities protected. It's kind of an advocacy you know, thing. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Are there any more questions? No, I don't have any at the moment. Okay, we don't want anybody to go away. Uh, still having questions. And this is Thomas, if we have just a minute, uh, let me remind 
people that uh, Russell posted a link to the comments I submitted to FERC. Uh, you'll see Friends of the Central Shenandoah reference there. And you can just click on that link and that will down uh, get you to uh, FERC's website where you can download my comments. And that would be a place to get all the references and details that backed up the uh, those summary slides that I presented today. It's in the earlier part of the comment stream. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. If there are no more questions, I want to take this moment to thank Kay Ferguson. Um, I didn't let you know, tell you that you do have um, um, there's refreshments on the back table. I want to thank everyone for coming. I hope you're leaving more uh, knowledgeable than you um, walked in. I want to thank all of the experts. Um, Daquan I guess had to had to leave. I'm glad that he, he was able to pop in. Um, Mark Sabbath, Suzanne Keller, Thomas Hadwin, um, William Barber the uh, third, Karen, Karen especially, not especially, but I hate doing that. But Karen, thank you because you did a lot of work in pulling this together. Um, and and others. Um, Anderson and um, Elizabeth Jones, who are right there. And I hope Bishop Kel uh, Kelstone, your question was um, answered. You wanted to know what the next steps were and what happens if they, if they um, do get, if they do um, get the permit on the 7th. So uh, that's still a fight to, to continue. Thank you, State and NAACP, for for being with us as, and our division, and quite and quite a few others that we've collected along the way who have our backs and are working with us. If there's no more um, no more questions, comments, or concern concerns anyone, then I guess this is the time to say good night and thank you so much for being here. Thank you.